Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarinet.com podcast, the podcast where we discuss clarinet news, do product reviews, interviews with prominent clarinetists, and even giveaways of, of really interesting products on the show. Today, I'm excited to share with you an interview that we had with Ryan Pereira of 3D Clarinet Innovations. And without any further ado, here's the interview. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Good. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me on the show today. Yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. This is going to be really, really interesting for our listeners. Um, first, why don't you tell me about yourself? Uh, what, what, Where are you from? What do you do? Well, I'm from northeastern Pennsylvania of the United States, but currently I live in Ithaca, New York. I am com- currently completing my undergraduate degree at the Ithaca College School of Music for clarinet performance and music education. What's it like there today? It's cold here. Uh, well, it's warmer than usual for December, let's put it that way. Yeah, so the temperature actually is going to be something we're going to talk about, because um, the barrels that you have been making are, I think they're temperature resistant to some extent, as far as cracking and, and typical that's problems great. that wood would have, so. Yes, yeah, we'll definitely get into that, that's for sure. Totally. So, um, you obviously play clarinet, or I don't know how else you would have come up with this idea, but what was the what was the inspiration for it? Uh, I happen to live in a house of engineers, believe it or not. Oh, okay. So my career path has always been music, but there were also influences of science involved. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I've always been interested in knowing how the clarinet works to a very detailed degree, and so I've experimented quite a bit with equipment. So how did it go from the beginning then? did you Was the barrel modeled from another example? Was it designed from scratch? And Is it in a computer program? Could you maybe walk us through that process and... For someone like me who has no idea about 3D printing at all, just give some insight as to how that works. Right. So the process for me began with studying many forms of uh, barrel board tapers. And I also have a couple tools where I measured some of the barrels that I had that played better for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had a couple different brands lined up. And it was it, that was most of the research part of things. Uh, after that, I created a sketch of the barrel with the original de- design that I wanted and modeled it using CAD software on the computer. So I'll actually draw out a sketch on the computer and um, it'll be made into a 3D file. Oh, okay, so, so this might be my misinterpretation of what 3D printing is, but it's it's not like a scanning process and then a printing process. You can actually design from scratch. You could do it both ways, actually. They're, they have 3D scanners, which you can use if you wanted uh, an exact replication of something, or you can model it yourself on the computer. So it is obviously um, a little different than wood, but what is the material that it's actually made out of? Is it some sort of plastic or, or rubber? I'm, I'm not sure. Well, uh, <laughs> the technical name for it is a high-impact polystyrene. Okay. But in a, in a simpler, simpler way to put it, it's basically a type of polymer. So it's a type of synthetic plastic. It has a high tactile strength, moderate elasticity for a hard material, and it's very well suited for reflecting sound waves. Interesting. So you've got a design on the computer. Um, how does it print it out? Does it, is it a subtractive process? Like does it cut it out of the plastic or does it actually print it as is? Well, it prints from the ground up. So going back to the whole process of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's say I finish my 3D model on the computer. Uh, after I export that into a, a certain type of file, I'll put it into my printer's software, and then that'll start. Uh, that program will start writing the code for it. Uh, once it creates a new file that's read by the printer, I just transfer it over to my printer, and it'll just it'll just build it in horizontal layers, and just keep moving on up until the entire item is made. Wow! So it's kind of like those. I don't know if you're. Um... If you can remember those old dot matrix printers, it's just in 3D now. So it kind of goes line by line, but but in in three dimensions? <laughs> yes, that's that's basically it right there. Okay. So when it's printed, but it's all finalized, um, is there any hand finishing that has to go into it? Or is the computer so accurate that that's somehow um, not necessary? Well, the appropriate answer would probably be both. So because 3D printer is quickly becoming more and more advanced, Accuracy isn't really something that is sacrificed. So when I when I take barrels out of the printer, if I were to measure them, they're always right in the ballpark. Interesting. I, so I there's no... Them. Like when I think of plastics and when they do plastics in like a mold, they've got to sort of cut them out of there and, and maybe do some sanding or something. But um, 
So this prints it exactly as it is. Wow. Yeah, this is a little bit more cleaner than that for sure. So um, the, I'll the, go ahead. <laughs> the material, sorry, um, the material, I, I noticed on these models that I have, the preliminary versions, they have a, 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 a sticker or a vinyl um, application on here. You're, you're saying now you're able to include your logo. What, what um, technical advancement did that require? That was actually a modeling software um, upgrade that I just got. So uh, originally it was a bit more complex in order to etch my logo, which isn't exactly the easiest shape to make. Yeah, it's um, a nice logo. Good work, by the way. Did you design that too? <laughs> yeah, I designed that. Thanks very much. Okay, so the, the first thing I noticed when I picked up your barrel was, wow, it's extremely light. Was that an intentional design um, idea or was it just part of the material or could, could you explain that a little bit? Yes, the, the weight is actually the first thing customers usually notice. And it was intentional, particularly for the bell. Um, it actually changes the center of gravity on the instrument, allowing the player to support the weight more toward the embouchure. Interesting. Yeah, so that, that tends to be um, a big advantage for the player. Now, for the bell, less weight seems to make the, the register transition seem more seamless. Uh, of course, the bell flare is important for that quality, but the weight made a pretty big impact on the development process. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember I not only when I put them together, I was thinking, wow, these are, are quite light. But then I actually put them on the clarinet, and I wasn't quite prepared for the weight decrease. It was quite noticeable. Do you, do you have a statistic on that? Is there like an actual, it must be about a third to me. It's it's much lighter. Uh, when I did, well, when I did weigh it, it was, it was a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was weighing the stock barrels and then my own. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was... It was around half the weight of the stock barrel. Really? Yeah, it, it's definitely a noticeable change. So to me, this is one of the more interesting aspects of the, the whole idea is that not only is it something that's um, more sustainable um, and more easily replicated perhaps than wood with other advantages we'll discuss in a minute, but there seems potentially to be a health benefit for those who suffer from tendonitis or, or even a, a sort of accessibility benefit for younger students or or older students, or people who cl carry their clarinet all day in a marching military band, or, or do you want to talk about that a bit? Is there sort of a interesting target market that opened up here you weren't maybe thinking of originally? Oh, yes. I, I've had benefits firsthand regarding this matter. Um, so I myself, I have a mild case of tendonitis around my right thumb, and I always use a neck strap when I'm playing. So having the less weight to um, support the instrument, it, it just removes the concern about you know, just that, supporting the instrument. So do you find it's so noticeable that when you go back to your old um, equipment, it, it actually starts to act up again? Uh, well, thankfully, the next drop kind of alleviates a lot of that pain. If I don't use it, though, it's it's night and day. So you find it's actually easier to play physically with the lighter equipment then? Oh, yeah. So it gives you one less thing to worry about, and mm -hmm. it's a pretty important thing. Well, and, you know, it's a common complaint, especially from people who've been playing... 10, 20, 30 years, um, right. even full-time in orchestras. I mean, I know that they have issues with with holding it. And a clarinet is not the most heavy instrument in the world, of course. It's, it's no tuba, but that still is quite a bit of weight on your, your your small thumb there. So That's true. Many bad habits can be made by sacrificing hand position to support the weight of the clarinet. Well, yeah, especially for young kids. I mean, I think it would be a really yep. interesting thing. And not to mention, a lot of times, um, classical music as a whole sort of is not as, um, I don't know, hip and cool for younger students and something that's 3D printed and kind of they can relate to um, would be kind of neat. I, I have a student actually who's, I go over to the lesson and as I get there, he's clearing away his, uh, he's made like a computer or something. <laughs> it's all beyond me, but he really, I showed him these and he, he thought they were quite cool. And I think he would be, you know, definitely interested in, in in that. Um, speaking of that, is there any sort of alternative colors or do they print black? They do print in black. I have a, a couple other colors, but um, I offer plenty of different customizable colors through my website. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can go on the website and the store will offer numerous color options for the rings of the barrel or the bell. Oh, so and that that's the new website on there. I, I didn't go through to buy one, but you can actually select different colors now on the, on your website? It's, it's a separate listing in the store where you have barrel and bell customization. Oh, very cool. And they have drop down menus where you can 
uh, clarify exactly what you want, what you need. So and let's say you're a marching band and your your colors are green and and <laughs> and red or so. That's kind of Christmassy, but maybe green and well, it's Christmas, whatever. Green and red. So you could maybe specify that you'd like to have that on your your barrels and bells. Exactly. For for a custom job like that, uh, you will have to go to the contact page and then mm-hmm. all you have to do is just you know send the email and coordinate all the details and it'll happen right away. So, it's, but it's possible. Absolutely. Wow, that's really cool. So you could actually be doing some custom branding. What about logos? If someone was wanting to have um, their marching band logo or something printed on there, is that something you're open to? Yes. So also on that page, you can order a custom paint job on it. Mm. And so what you can do is, again, through the contact page, you, you can send an image of a design, and that very design can be painted onto your barrel. Wow. I also offer an engraving service, so if you want a name or initials on your barrel or bell, that's possible as well. And is that done with some sort of laser etching or uh, some sort of um, pick tool, or how does that work? Yeah, it's it's a uh, laser engraver. Very cool. Yeah, I'm seeing the. You must be seeing the opportunities opening up for this. It's a really cool idea. <laughs> so let's talk about the material some more. Um, we know now it's a. I think you said a, a polymer of some sort. Right. It's basically that? yeah. It's basically a type of polymer. Okay, so that's a plastic essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, typically clarinets are made of wood, but there are some benefits to this material. Do you want to talk about some of those benefits? Right. This is part of the inspiration that led me to the 3D printing technology. So, um, yes, they are crack resistant, which is excellent. You can take these barrels and bells outside in any climate and you won't have to worry about cracks or changes in the dimensions. I myself, when I was a uh, student teaching recently, I was... I was in pep band, and um, you know I'm running the clarinet section at the time, and um, I just took my plastic Bundy out, and I slapped my own barrel, my own bell on it, and not only did it feel much more like my standard setup, but it just, it's just so much easier to play, and the sound is much improved. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, and what what about um, sustainability as far as this goes? I mean, there's some there's some thoughts now that uh, using Grenadilla wood and and the other sources of wood for clarinets is not something we can even potentially have long term. Um, what are the ramifications of this for that? Right. So uh, this this material is widely available, and there there will definitely be no foreseeable shortage of it at any point. So it's uh, it's definitely sustainable, and um, the. The company that I get my material from is a growing company, and they're expanding every single day. So, yeah, I th- this stuff will just keep coming. So let's say one did, um, unfortunately, were to break somehow. I don't know are, how durable are they. Like, have you found um, they can sustain a drop? Is that something you'd want to test them on? Or I was considering actually making a video where yeah. I was going to drop one off my balcony. And uh, I might actually do that. If in you do future. that, I'll put it on the. I made that YouTube <laughs> channel. We can throw it up there and sort of do a. Do you know that um, will it blend video? Oh yeah, he yes. blends things. I don't know if we need to blend one of your barrels, but it would yeah, just be interesting great. to see kind of a drop tester or, or something. Because um, wood, you know, you know well probably if it drops, the impact can cause a crack as well. Um, right. But, but with this, my question was more. Let's say one does break, unfortunately, or somehow manages to wear out over a long time. Are they then recyclable? Is this something you could kind of melt down and turn into a new barrel or some other product or are they, has that been Uh, something you thought about? That's, that's probably, uh, through the terms of recycling, it's probably not possible because, uh, these, the material starts out on a spool. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a fine thin, uh, thread that goes through the printer's extruder and then it comes out and you know just prints layer by layer as we mentioned oh of course so if but it is some sort of plastic so surely it must be able to i don't know if it could go in with the the juice boxes or whatever else you you recycle but it seems like it (laughs) it would work i don't know so i don't know if you're the person to ask about this but are there any differences between wood and um this material that that people should be aware of well uh that kind of lies in the 3d printing process Mm-hmm. So wood is more of a fibrous material, whereas when I'm printing in you know these polymer materials, it's it's more it's dealing more with shells and layers rather than fibers. Mm-hmm. So when I'm setting things up in my software, I have more um, 
I'm, I'm able to customize how the material is distributed more than if I were in the wood. Mm -hmm. So that that gives me um, more of a palette of options as far as fine tuning resistance and uh, mass, which definitely affects the tone color. So you could theoretically increase and decrease the density of this material. Yeah, you could. Oh wow! Pretty easily, actually. Right. Dude, when I played it, I found it was it was really interesting. I it had a sort of resonance and vibration to it um, that was really really something. I couldn't really explain it actually. Um, yeah, have yeah. You found I, other people have have noticed that. Absolutely. So um, because this uh, technology it prints things in a horizontal layers. Yeah. Um, that actually, it affects the way that the sound waves reflect from the surface. Mm -hmm. That's, that's all part of the, you know, more complicated acoustics study about it. Yeah. And I don't even know if that's possible with wood, because I think that if the grain were that way, it wouldn't, wouldn't work or something. I'm not sure, but. Yeah. And that could change whether if I print it on its side or if I print it straight up and down. Yeah. I guess you could get different acoustical are... properties with that. So. Definitely, there are multiple options in order to manufacture these things. So we've talked a lot about the material and, and what, it, what it looks like and what it can look like and, and some of the benefits, but we haven't talked a lot about how it sounds. Um, what have, what have uh, users and customers and yourself had, had thought about the, the way it sounds and feels? Well, uh, sort of as we were just discussing, mm -hmm. the physics of the material are such that when it interacts with the sound wave produced by the player... The reflection of the of the wave reacts completely different than wood, metal, rubber, or any of those other types of materials. Mm -hmm. So materials like wood, like I mentioned, are fibrous, whereas 3D printing my synthetic materials, it deals with those layers. Yeah, and that just allows my materials to be more versatile. So when I was trying it, like I actually was able to use it in a concert, and again, I was impressed. The intonation and and uh, the projection was was quite nice, and and. Um, I did notice it was a little brighter than my other barrels, but I'm wondering that's probably more something to do with the bore or the density than the material itself. Well, may I ask which model were you using during the concert? Uh, the traditional. Using the traditional. Yes, yes. That's definitely the um, the most pure and brightest sound of the of the lineup that I have right now. Oh, okay. So the bold. Uh, yeah, I, you're right, actually. I didn't try the bold. It's a little bit darker. Um, you said you just came out with a new one. You want to talk about that a little bit? That's true. I am coming out with a brand new model that that will be launching in January 2016, and while well, I'm holding it in my hand right now, it's unofficially named the MR model, but it's combining the best of both worlds between the traditional and the bold. So I wanted to lean more towards the depth of sound that I would get with the bold model. Mm -hmm. So there's more richness and a little bit more darkness to the sound. Um, so what I did is. The uh, reverse taper is actually a little bit more severe than in the other models. Yeah. And the outside walls were thickened, but it keeps the out outside shape of the traditional. So that actually helps the sound focus quite a bit more. And it has that dark and well, boldness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the new one. So this, this is kind of three now, then. You're going to have the traditional, which is more of the pure, um, brighter tone. The bold, which is more... Um, a little warmer, and then the MR, you said it was called, and that's the sort of the darkest, most robust yeah. sounding? Yes, is that the right and one? also its playability is very smooth. I'm very excited to launch this next month. Cool. So um, we're just going to play a quick musical example here. This is uh, this is you playing, right, Ryan? That's right. Yeah, so I'm just going to play this here. He's playing, uh, do you know which barrel you're playing on this recording? This is the brand new MR model. Right, so that's kind of what it sounds like. It's a very sweet tone. You have a very nice sound. Um, what kind of clarinet are you playing it with? Uh, the clarinet is a Buffet R13 Prestige B flat clarinet. So this is um, th these must be designed then for the clarinet then, or? Right. I I have um, well on my website I have an option where they could uh, contact me if they do happen to play a summer instrument. I found that uh, these barrels are compatible with the Yamahas pretty well. And players that do own a LeBlanc 
they shouldn't have an issue with the standard models. But I could definitely accommodate anybody who plays different brands of clarinets. Great. Yeah, no, it sounds really, really good. Um, so one last question. I don't know if this is something that you've thought about or been asked yet, but um, will customers eventually, as 3D printing technology um, develops and they become the printers become more common in the home, are people going to be able to order and print them themselves or just are they going to be available through the website and um, retail channels only? Well, unfortunately, there's a little bit more to the process than just using a file. Mm -hmm. Well, as of right now, the technology is not exactly universal. So uh, different software for different printers can read the files differently. And the parts themselves uh, require a multitude of settings when preparing the file for the print process. So the short answer is right now, no, but, but possibly in the future? Possibly. There, there are just a lot of factors that go into it. So replicating these items is... Well, that's that's very difficult. So that goes back to the the design and the process, I guess. So right now, three D printers, it's not it's not really like owning a um, a paper printer. You can't just download a PDF document and print it anywhere. It's it's a little more involved than that. For something as intricate as this application, yeah. yes. Okay, great. So, is there anything else you'd like to share about your products or talk about? Uh, well, there, I know there'll be many players out there who are hesitant to try things that stray from the standard. And uh, I've had many people who were solely for wood barrels, and they tried my own barrels, and they were just so enchanted by the playing experience that they switched right away. Yeah, it's and, something. I, it's it's interesting you say that because I was thinking about how um, I'm not sure if if it would fit, well, if it would fit every single application. But sometimes it's nice to have something else in your toolbox. And there are times, even now, when I, I find I'm going back and forth between my phobes or my bakun or my stock barrel, and it would be kind of nice to add this in the mix. Yeah, some, pl some players find the hybrid system between their wood clarinets and synthetic barrels and bells to offer great qualities in both sound and feel. So, Ryan, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Um, before we get to some listener questions, where is a place that people could find your products online other than the clarinet.com website? Well, anybody who would like to find out more details can feel free to visit Pereira 3D Clarinet Innovations website at www.pereira3d.com. That's www.pereira3d.com. Do you also have a Twitter handle or a Facebook page you'd like to share? I currently have a Facebook page. Uh, it's facebook.com slash pereira3d. Great. All right. Well, Ryan, before we wrap up here, um, I'd like to ask some listener questions that people posted on the clarinet.com Facebook page. Um, David C. asks, are there any plans to produce mouthpieces using this material? Would they and if so, would they require any type of hand finishing? Sure, that's a very interesting question. So mouthpieces are definitely possible with this technology, and you may have just happened something that I'm starting to experiment with. Uh, the tolerances of 3D printing technology are nearly good enough to produce mouthpieces, but hand finishing will be involved in order to improve the consistency between them. Yeah. So as we know, the facing curve is incredibly intricate mm -hmm. so when the technology improves even more there may not be a need for hand finishing but i think as of right now where the technology stands it will require a little bit of hand finishing so that kind of is related to gail's question too actually gail s asks are there plans to produce an entire 3d clarinet or 3d reads and i guess that sort of leads into 3d all sorts of clarinet accessories have, have you considered branching out into that yeah uh these things are in the cards. Um, I'm currently possibly developing a French horn mouthpiece with a colleague of mine at the college. Oh, interesting. And, uh, I have this brass filament that might be ideal for that sort of application. Oh, so it can print to metal too? That's true. I Oh, I should have touched base on this earlier. So when I was testing out the materials, I was able to try a wood filament. I was able to try metal filaments such as brass and silver. Oh, that's very Which, cool. Th these are hybrid uh, materials that are made of a certain percentage of, say, wood and then a certain percentage of the plastic. And then they're made into a spool of filament that you just put right into the printer. So there's the potential for non-plastic um, variations of this that could have even even more uh, color variation and, and, and feel and weight and all sorts of things, I guess. Wow. 
that's all part of the advancements of the technology. So for some person who maybe wasn't as interested in the weight elements and they were a little more resistant to try something non-wood, um, are there is there a plan then to have a, a, a wood model with sort of a more silver traditional ring on it? Or I'm currently testing some options with the wood filament. And uh, it's still fairly lightweight. Because keep in mind, this is a hybrid material with the plastics. Um, One thing we forgot to touch on, actually, was the element of price here. These barrels are are quite a bit um, more affordable than alternative options. That's what's, true. what's your pricing like? So currently, the traditional model is set at eighty-five dollars, whereas the and the bold model is set at ninety-five dollars. My bells are set at one hundred and fifty. But that is yeah, that is starkly different from from comp competition that is hand handcrafted out of wood right now. Um, but would using the other filaments obviously bring up the price, or would it be able to stay that competitive? They'll be in the same bar, uh, ballpark as the ones that I'm producing now. Wow, so it's a, the whole process then is much more efficient that way. Yeah, that was one of the attractive elements about using the technology. Well, and again, for stu if we go back, I mean, to, for students or, or larger band programs, and once you factor in the durability, I mean, I imagine it's a huge savings. Absolutely. And you can buy it for March Band or you can buy it for Symphony Orchestras. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I've neglected that element. I, I'm so focused on <laughs> my <laughs> thoughts for students. But yeah, I mean, even um, for symphony players to have those options to completely customize. It's not just wood now. We can completely customize the material that's being used on your your instrument, which is extremely cool. So that kind of takes me to Daniel L's question, actually. Um I don't know if it would be just for more exacting players or for the average customer, but um, since the products are being 3D printed, does that make customizing equipment for each individual faster or easier, or does working with the computer model require more time than adjusting by hand? Right. Well, customization is a specialty of mine. Uh, so the answer is yes. Getting a feel for modeling on the computer takes some time because there's a learning curve involved. Uh, but I can quickly make adjustments and send them right to the printer, and it doesn't take much time for me at all. So with the ability for, let's say, uh, some symphony player with the very exacting specifications to, to order basically exactly what he or she wants? Absolutely. There's now an option on the website store. There's a listing where you can uh, buy some uh, barrel customization involving the board. So therefore, you can just use a contact page and specify what you want the entrance board to be or the exit for, or even if you want certain specifications for the outside profile. Wow, that's amazing. And what are the... Um, I, I, we also didn't discuss how long does it take to print one. Is this something that someone could order and have sort of the next week? I mean, obviously, we're not waiting for a tree to grow. And is it something that rather quick? Well, the modeling... It could take any time from under an hour to maybe a couple of hours. And printing itself is only about four hours. Wow, so something really, a, a turnaround is, could be less than a day on something like that. It can be. It will need some more lead time if you're ordering a custom job. Yeah, oh yeah, of it's course. still not but... taking that long. That's great. Really interesting. So the last question, which is maybe the most forward thinking of them, and uh, is entirely relevant, but what, what are the next plans? Is as the clarinet becomes a more modern instrument with modern materials, um, what are some new elements that, that the clarinet could, could have from these type of innovations? Well, yeah, that's definitely an interesting question. Well, we can go back to the 1920s where you have sounds from legendary players. Uh, like take Daniel Bonan, for instance. That type of sound is a lot different from what we hear in the modern days. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so thinking about that, and the introduction of the polycylindrical bore from Buffet. And then after that, mouthpieces were made to accommodate that. Yeah, so. I think if I can just jut in here for a second, I think that um, one of the things we sometimes forget is that clarinet is an instrument that has evolved over time. And, and maybe this is something that can really bring it into, the, into a new era. Yeah, we never had the opportunity to exactly tell the machine how to lay the material or what the layers should be like or what the density should be like. 
there's definitely more customization involved in this sort of technology. It's interesting. It would actually be like telling a tree exactly how to grow, exactly how you <laughs> how you want it to be. And one of the things I find most interesting is that it's it's a you said it was an additive process instead of subtractive. So we don't start with this block of plastic. You start right. with just exactly what you want. Yeah, it starts with an empty build platform, and then you just you know attach the spool of material in there, and it builds it from the ground up. So Ryan, I think uh, we've had a great chat, and we've asked some listener questions, which I'm so happy people took the time to submit those. I hope that the answers we got are what you were looking for. But of course, uh, people are interested in the giveaway, and you've been very generous with uh, with the giveaway here on the podcast. You've sent in four barrels. There's two traditional and two bold in the lengths 65 and 66 millimeters. And then there's one of your barrels that you've, sorry, bells that you've supplied us with as well. Um, I think what we're going to do is provide those to two listeners. One listener will receive the barrels of their choice and the bell. And then the runner up will receive uh, the other set of barrels. And, And that way someone gets kind of a complete a more complete experience with your products right off the bat. Um, Well, actually, I'd like to add in a third winner into the mix who will be receiving the brand new MR model that's launching next month. Amazing. And they they can specify whichever length that they'd prefer, uh, but it just adds more surprise to the mix. Great. So we've got three prizes now. That's fantastic. I think people are going to be super... Super excited about that. And I just wanted to say that I'm going to, or clarinet.com is going to cover um, shipping to anywhere in the world on those items. So don't worry if you live in in, uh, in Japan or, or Canada or, or wherever, you're still eligible to win. And um, I think that you're going to really enjoy these these barrels. They're amazingly light and the sound is, is really, really resonant. And um, yeah, fantastic product. So... Thank you so much, Ryan, for for your time today and for talking with us. And um, I hope we hear more from 3D Clarinet Innovations in the future. Thanks again for having me, Sean. Thanks so much. If you'd like the chance to win products mentioned on the Clarinet.com podcast, you can do so in five ways. We'll be pooling the subscribers from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube. See Clarinet.com for more details. If you find that you're enjoying the podcast, you can support it in four ways. You can follow and interact on our social media sites, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can follow the podcast at SoundCloud, YouTube, or iTunes. It'd be even more helpful if you left positive reviews and shared with your friends. You can also discuss and share content from the podcast on your own blog, podcast, or social media with friends, colleagues, students, and family. Or you can support it directly by purchasing your neat and new clarinet products from the clarinet.com online store at clarinet.com slash store. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. We've got a really exciting interview with Michael Norsworthy from the Boston Conservatory planned for next week.